that's what embedded entrepreneurship is, which is a concept that I consider to be the least risky and most community centric way of figuring out how you can help people, which is just really go into your communities, shut up and listen to what they what they talk about. Like, do they complain about stuff? Do they ask each other for help? Do they ask for alternatives or recommendations for tools that they think they need or they know they need, but can't find or they don't exist? Welcome to the Never Employed Chat. My name is Sam and I interview people who make a living beyond salary jobs, entrepreneurs, business owners, and investors, so that we can learn from their stories together. There are many great ways to make a living and even more ways to wealth. At Never Employed, we encourage you to think of alternatives to employment jobs. What would you do if a salary job was simply no option? I certainly have lots of stories to tell. That should not be a problem. <laughs> so anything in particular you want to talk about today, like any particular topic? The most obvious thing is probably your business feedback panda, which you built together mm -hmm. with your partner and uh, mm -hmm. eventually sold. But I'd also like to talk about the things you're doing these days and your life after the big exit. Mm -hmm. So you just said that living in Europe was a mm -hmm. good position for you during the development yeah. of your business. Why, why is that the case? It was it was almost uh, an accident that it happened. Like it actually started with an accident. The whole story kind of started with an accident. Danielle, my partner, she had a, a leg injury, and we were at that time living in Berlin, in Germany. Even though she's Canadian, and we were kind of traveling back and forth, we visit family and that kind of stuff. And she had an accident here in Canada, where I now live, or where we now live. I guess we're still together, obviously. And um, she had a little accident. We flew back to Berlin, and she she had trouble walking. And she's an opera singer, so she couldn't really do her opera stuff. So she had to find a job to do from home, and that was online English teaching for Chinese companies. And th those companies obviously were located far to the east from Germany. But their customers were both in China and their clients, the teachers that they hired, were in the United States. So they were far west of Germany. And that put us in a really interesting place because we were quite literally in the middle of this globally distributed system of Chinese children learning to speak English from American or like South African and British teachers, but mostly American and Canadian teachers. So by, by random chance, we found ourselves located in the perfect location between these two markets and that really helped because had we been closer to the states had we moved to canada earlier and and try to run this business from canada we would have have to get up early in the morning like at 4 a.m because that's kind of when the chinese evening teaching cycle started and those American teachers would have to teach these kids late in the Chinese evening, very early in the American morning. But since we were in Europe, it was like a nine to five job for us. Like <laughs> nobody in that whole setting benefited from a nine to five job, but us, because the Americans had to get up early and the Chinese had to stay up late. We had a regular job. So it was just a perfect location to be in. And we consciously chose that location. We stayed in Berlin for the longest time. Um, we started the business in 2017. We sold it in 2019. And after that, well, you know, everything after 2019 is just a different world, unfortunately, right? With the pandemic happening, we stayed in Berlin for a while, but there was really nothing for us there because the city was shut down. And as much as I missed the city, I really missed Döna and I missed the cultural diversity of Berlin. Like I live in a very small town in Canada now, which has its own benefits, but you know, it's different. It's not 4 million people. It's a couple thousand. So, uh, and with that, the opportunities are different too, but in, in Berlin, there was really nothing for us um, left other than friends, obviously, and, and the connections that we had made. But we had run our business from essentially our living room, right? from from our bedroom like, or the, the garage, if you had had one. It was a very a home, home-centric home business, a remote business, fully remote. We took it with us when we visited family here in Canada. So there was no reason for us to not move closer to family to actually be with people in a time where being with people was hard, like 2021, which it still is, right? But, you know, it was even, even harder back then. So we did that. Last year, 2021, we moved to Canada, took everything we had with us, which was a whole other story, like the logistics of moving in the middle of a container shortage. It was it was bizarre, but um, it, we took everything we had with us and I took, well, I, a fledging media business that I had started after selling the business with, with me. And that's kind of what I run here from my basement, from which you get to hear and see me at this uh, in this very moment. 
kind of started something else after we sold the business, but it took a while for it to take off. And I think now, um, two, two and a half years after I'm at a point where my writing, my podcasting, my video making, and all, all these kind of things, my newsletter are making a sufficient amount of money to sustain a business as well. It took a while to do this, but uh, it certainly was an interesting project. So that's why I'm right now. Started as a software engineer 10, 15 years ago. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know how old I am. I, yeah, 38-ish <laughs> around that time. So I, I, in my mid-20s, I became like a serious software engineer. And then after many, many failed attempts at building businesses, this one succeeded. And with that came a lot of understanding, a lot of experience. That's what I'm trying to share now in my writing and everything I'm doing. But yeah, there we go. SaaS business, media business, and moved around the globe. Yeah, that's super cool. Many, many topics already. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that, that you mentioned uh, the, the fact of uh, many, many started businesses because I um, wasn't sure if you if, if Feedback Panda was your first uh, like uh, unicorn kind of business wow. uh, which uh, started uh, going through the roof or uh, yeah, what, what what did you do before? I can tell you a couple of stories. So all of these are German businesses too. So that's going to be very interesting, but mostly for people who try to build businesses in Europe and, and Germany in particular. So with a couple of friends back in uh, 2013-ish, I uh, started a business in Berlin trying to build a local food marketplace for the city because Berlin is full of hipsters, still is, full of foodies, full of people who are interested in getting good food from outside the city. And outside the city, there are a lot of friends farmers right? around Berlin and Brandenburg, which is like the surrounding um, state, you find a lot of farms that are like, producing really high quality food, vegetables and, and raise animals ethically and that kind of stuff. And, and we kind of wanted to bridge this. We wanted to bring these people's products into the city and allow people from within the city to not have to travel far, but actually get it delivered. So that was the idea, but build a marketplace. Initially, we centered it around these weekend markets that pop up a lot in Berlin, like all these little places in the city where there's just a couple of huts and people sell fresh vegetables. It's really adorable and it's it's quite enjoyable too. We tried to connect these farmers coming there with the people in their local area. And it was all an interesting project, but it failed horribly. Just really can tell you that it did not work out because we were three people in a in a team, a designer, the, the CEO, the, the person with the idea and all the kind of business chops really, and me as the CTO in that business. And we sat down, we rented an office, big mistake number one, we started building a platform that we thought people needed, mistake number two, and we built it essentially in stealth mode for six months. So that was like mistake number three right there. So we, we built something that we didn't validate with anybody. We built a two-sided marketplace without having any kind of strategy how to bootstrap these two sites alongside each other. It was horrible. We launched it, it fizzled out. We tried getting traction on one side. Well, if if you talk to a farmer and you tell them, well, we have no customers, but you have to do all these steps to sell your stuff, they're not going to say yes. And the same goes for customers. Well, we don't really have any farmers on the platform. We can't buy anything. So we want to check it out. Like that just doesn't work. So that's kind of where that pro product fizzled out. The company still exists, funny enough, because um, Robert, the, the CEO, he, he pivoted the the whole project from marketplace to a food subscription delivery service aimed more at b2b which is now in berlin still active uh, providing people with like vegetable boxes or fruit boxes in offices which make a lot of more sense now that has gone through a very interesting challenge with the pandemic as well and in berlin in particular there were, were a lot of lockdowns that were then kind of stopped and then people could go back go back to work and there were more lockdowns and you know they went back home and back to work and you could really see this in that particular business like whenever the lockdown started people would cancel their business subscriptions but the personal private delivered to my home subscriptions would go up and when the, the lockdown was reverted and people went back to the office they would cancel their home subscription and the business subscriptions would, would go back up it was it's quite a fluctuation a lot of that stuff there but so that business is kind of you know starting to grow in a different niche pivoted away but the thing that we initially built back then that didn't work at all mostly because we didn't validate enough and I had another business, I have more of these stories, we're just going to tell you these two, that I started with a friend that I used to work back um, before 
2013, back when I was in Silicon Valley, I had a, um, a little stint there for a VC funded startup, which was super interesting. But a friend from that company, a coworker there, we, we became friends. We both lived in Berlin and we started a company together trying to build um, a photo upload system or a media upload system for embedded journalists, people who go into war zones to take photos and have this really shaky connection to send the photos to the DPA or, or Reuters or these agencies right, where, they, where they have to upload these files. And the news agency uh, world is still apparently living in the late 90s because they have unsecured FTP servers to which you have to upload your files named after a certain convention so that they know who to pay money for if they use the photo. It's really horribly like complicated in terms of technology. Metadata, probably haven't heard of that before. It's really bizarre, but we built something for them. We built an upload tool where people would upload the file once and we would redistribute it to all the agencies so they could save bandwidth while they were back then in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever the next war is probably now would be a, a good use in the, in the Ukraine. But the problem was we didn't do any marketing again, big mistake, right? We had a product. Uh, we had one of our co-founders was a journalist. He knew what they needed apparently, but he didn't really do any kind of outreach to the, to the photojournalist community or any kind of journalist community. So we had the product, we had one paying customer and that was it. No, no further customers. So we kind of, you know, stopped that product. And it was unfortunate because that business with some additional marketing probably would have been a serious and interesting way of making some money and helping people even more who really need this to do that job. So along the way with all these products and many others that didn't really work out, I understood the, the meaning of risk in entrepreneurship and kind of how blind we all can be when we think we know what we're doing, right? When we look at, at a product that we're building from the perspective of the solution, oh yeah, this solves this problem and it, I, I, I'm i gonna build the next, this product, right? Because we, we experience the world around us in this kind of producty way. When you look at what you have in front of you, which is at this point, likely a phone or a computer or you know a stereo system if you live in the eighties, like something that uh, is, is a physical product. And that's how we experience everything around us, right? Everything we touch is a tool. Everything we interact with is some kind of system that is a product. And as founders, we, we make the mistake of thinking as of the product first because we think, oh yeah, we're going to build this tool instead of considering that, well, let's kind of forget the product idea for a second and look what, into what people really need and how we can talk to them to A, find out what they need, what their problems are, if they're even aware of their own problems at all, and B, if they have a budget to pay for this, you know, where they are, all these things that are, you should really validate before you jump into even thinking of how you might be helping them, right? The idea, the product, that is a consequence. That's not the starting point. And I learned this throughout this journey of starting with the idea and starting with the product and then failing to validate a need for it and failing to validate a market for it, failing to validate even a problem for it. The whole food thing in Berlin, we noticed that people didn't really care this much. Yeah, if they got good food, wonderful, but that was not a central thing that they would pay a lot of money for. So yeah, it's, it's all about learning from your mistakes and I made plenty of mistakes. So now I learned a lot, still making mistakes along the way, right? Like even with my media business that I have now, I probably could do more and do stuff better, right? But but I'm at least I'm enjoying my journey and I'm learning as I go. And I share those learnings so I, at least something comes out of it. Yeah, cool. So you you already uh, kind of touched on the solution or the um, statement on what you would do different if if you could. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. yeah, maybe just to, to ask that again. What what would you do different today when you when you start a business? Yeah, I think the, like, let, let me take the example with the local food marketplace, um, because we can dissect this in a nice way. First off, I would be really, really afraid to start a marketplace, a two sided or even multi sided marketplace as my very first business. That's just inviting complexity into a world where you want simplicity, right? If you want to bootstrap a business, and I kind of think that's the assumption here, you want to build a business that is self-funded, that doesn't have like millions of funding that you need to kind of crawl into other people's uh, communities into like, or, or raise um, by pitching all the time. You want to build a business that is stable from the start, that generates revenue slowly, but surely over time. If you want to build that, you need 
uh, a business that is not highly volatile, that is not super risky, that does not need like the constellation of three different markets to be perfect for you to succeed. You want something that is um, less complex. So I probably wouldn't build a three-sided or two-sided um, marketplace for local food. I would try to find a simple iteration on something that already exists in the market and see if I can make it better for a more well-defined group of people. Let's kind of think about this. There are two parties here. You have the farmers and you have people who like food. I would assume that out of these two groups, the one that has the most budget for a tool that actually brings some kind of meaningful value to them is probably the farmers. Even though foodies have kind of dispensable income, but farmers have a cal calculation there, right? If I spend $20 and I make $200, this is a good investment. For food, you, you eat it, then it's gone. It's kind of hard to, to make that the same logical decision here. So I would look into farmers and, and instead of thinking of what farmers need, go to the farmers that I have relationships with and talk to them and follow them along and see how do they use technology? Can I even build a software enabled business for them? Or are these people that still have a phone from the nineties, right? Some of them are. Like we worked with a couple of farmers before for that local food marketplace. And there was like, do you even have a computer? And they were like, I guess like this, this windows 98 PC. That was like 2000. 13 right it's it's not that this is like the actual um early 2000s or early 90s this is a couple of years ago or a decade i guess but still these people were not the most te technology friendly people they knew that there was something in their future where they would kind of need to get on board with this but they weren't there yet so i would look at where are they now and what is the next step for them not what is my next step what is the next big thing that i need to build but what is the next step along their path towards a more digital business that they run that they could use? So for farmers, that would probably be, how do I manage my inventory, right? How do I manage the machinery that I have, like the, the service contracts around that? Because that is important to farmers. They buy, and I, I know this because I live in, in a place surrounded by farmers. Right? Not only are there farmers in my family, there's like five or six farmers here. And they, they, like, they raise cattle. They have grains and, and beans and all that stuff. I see them on machinery that costs millions of dollars that needs to be maintained, that needs to be insured. All of this is a little thing that you could easily build a whole business around, right? You don't need to build a gigantic marketplace, just um, an inventory tool for them to, to understand, like, when do my service leases expire? And when getting a notification a couple of weeks before that happens, so they can kind of put it into their plans. All of this would be an interesting problem to solve, but you need to go to them and talk to them and figure out what their priorities are to see how you can help them. So instead of assuming that people from the city want food from outside the city, would we'll talk to people. That's a, the big, biggest thing. And I think that's what embedded entrepreneurship is, which is uh, a concept that I consider to be the least risky and most community centric way of figuring out how you can help people, which is just really go into your communities, shut up and listen to what they, what they talk about. Like, do they complain about stuff? Do they ask each other for help? Do they ask for alternatives or recommendations for tools that they think they need or they know they need, but can't find, or they don't exist? The community is full of chatter all the time. And if you look at Twitter around these days, everybody's complaining about everything, right? There's always something going on and you can see people really want a better experience in terms of how they communicate online. Any community, for any industry does this all the time. You just have to go in there, participate in a positive, non-salesy way and listen to what people talk about. And over time, you will find certain things bubble up to the top in terms of frequency and intensity. And those are the critical problems that people always have, can't really solve. And that's the stuff you can tackle with them and for them because you're in a community. You might just as well get their help while getting to whatever product idea you need. So like I said, the idea, the product is a consequence of your work, figuring out the underlying problem for a validated existing audience. Because if you go into a community of a couple thousand people, just look on Reddit, there's all these subreddits for all these little things. Most of them have hundreds, if not thousands of people. If you go in there and you see people complaining about it, you know, there are thousands of people. They are right there. The number is right there in the corner, right? You can see that this is a validated group of people. Instead of assuming, oh, there are foodies in Berlin, 
sure it would have probably i've seen one right that doesn't that's no no number there there's no quantitative data you can act on but if you go into a community you become part of it and you see people actually interact that is validation and from there you validate the problem that they have you validate its criticality that it's not just a problem but the problem like one of the things that they actually have budget for because a problem that they have no budget for well, you can create a solution, but then nobody buys it. Right? It's another problem for you to build a business around. So, or it's not a good one. So you then build a solution with them and for them, turn it into a product, and there you go. At least there's a higher chance. There's no guarantee. There's never a guarantee in entrepreneurship, but there's a higher chance that with all the groundwork you've done, you are now building something that at least solves a validated problem for a validated audience. That's how we would approach it, right? That's how I would go into any new topic. And that's kind of how I do go into any new projects at this point. And as far as I know, or as I imagine, that's also what you basically did with Feedback Panda, right? So mm -hmm. in, in the end, yeah. it was probably just, you know, that uh, there are people who needed some, some kind of tool or whatever, who had certain problems because you... I've been close to your your partner in this example, yeah. and you you just experienced the the challenges. Yeah, I I saw them. I, I two things here. First of all, I was really close to the the challenge itself because I saw Danielle teach for ten hours straight a day, which is a lot of online teaching. If you do this like in a in a Zoom call, this is an animated Zoom call where you dance and you clap and you try to to motivate a child to speak a language that they don't speak. Right? This is intense work. So if you do this for ten hours already, and then you have to do like two extra hours of additional like manual administrative work, that's not fun. And I saw like all her joy being siphoned away from her life by, by having to do this. So it was very clear to me that this problem is painful because it was almost physically painful. On the other side, you could see this in the community too. Like Danielle was part of all these teacher communities because they wanted their, their teachers to, to foster community amongst each other and exchange like methods, uh, how to teach well and, and little like, templates and stuff already. So you saw communities organizing themselves around their problems. Not only did they talk about feedback, which Feedback Panda was all about, like student feedback, what we would give a parent, tell a parent what you did right, in the lesson. That's really what it is. Like today we learned about apples. Here's what the student can like practice for the next lesson. That's really what it is. So sometimes something really short, but if you do this like for 20 different children, 20 different experience levels, you have a lot to write. And we automated that with our business. And we did that because we saw not only did the community talk about it all the time, like every day in this Facebook group, somebody would complain about feedback. Like quite literally every day, multiple times, you would find people find, finding the existing solutions horrendous. But the community itself was so like distraught by this problem that they started organizing themselves around tools. They opened a col collaborative Google Doc where they shared little feedback templates with each other already to make this less of a problem. And when we saw that there is a technological solution to this problem that people are already trying to establish, but they are they are not technical people. They are online teachers. They are teachers, right? These were people whose second or real job was uh, to be a brick and mortar teacher in an actual school after they taught online in the morning. They got up at four, taught until seven, got to their school and then taught until the late afternoon. It was crazy. This is the United States for you where you have to have two jobs to make ends meet, sometimes three. It was bizarre. So these people knew that they needed help with this. They started doing it themselves, but couldn't do it well. And I had the technical capacity to do it better. I built something that worked for Danielle. She looked at it and said, no, this doesn't work. <laughs> then I built something better. And that we brought into the community, which found immediate adoption because it was a tool just like what they needed because Danielle knew the exact uh, shape of the problem. And then from within that community, we built certain things into the product that allowed word of mouth marketing to be our main driver for the whole business. I think we experimented a little bit with Google ads, didn't work with Facebook ads, kind of worked, but not enough. But once we had a referral system in place, that was all we did. We had organic um, just growth from organic referrals within the product and within the community too, right? We tried to be active in the community and that made a lot of difference as well. So yeah, we validated it from not just um, 
people talking about it, but from people already having a crude solution in place. And you see this quite a lot. Like the moment you see wonky files system somewhere like air tables here connected with no code to something else and which is great like it's great that you can build these things but it is a whole different story if you have a software tool dedicated to solving this problem for you that has like import export capabilities tracking versions and all these things that you can't really do with the, the tools as they exist in the in the wild if you build a specific tool to solve this problem well, people are willing to pay for it because also it's a centralized tool. So you don't have to pay for Airtable here and Zapier there. And you know, you have one location where you get your solution. And that implementation of the, the business and business needs, the logic of the business, that is how most SaaS businesses really start, right? You have this problem, you solve it in one specific way, and then you kind of customize it and all that stuff. But yeah, if you see crude solutions in the world where people and anywhere people emailing each other files is usually a good place to look, right? There, there's um, this business called Endcrawl, which is, um, they render end of movie credits, like the thing that just scrolls down with all the names and stuff. And in the beginning, they they, they just saw the, the whole like rendering credits world is super old school. Like you you sent your credits to people in a, in, a, in a text file and they set it for you and then they render it. And like four days later, you get your rendering. Let's just make a Google doc like a really basic Google Doc where you put in your thing and we, we throw it through a, a Perl script at that point, render it, and like five minutes later, you get the file. With that, they just, just revolutionize. They revolutionize the idea of how quickly you can get your credits, your end credits. And what a specific problem to solve, right? Like such a, this is, it's not the whole movie that gets rendered. It's just the part where things scroll down. And now Uncrawl is making quite some money. They've been in, in uh, Sundance festival films, like big box office movies, uh, just being used because they're such a good and easy to use tool. And they started out with a, like a Perl script. That's really what it was. So you don't even need to build a complicated thing. You just need to build something better than the crude and slow solutions that people have in the existing space. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting point too look for for these crude solutions and not mm -hmm. trying to to come up with problems or solutions yourself yeah, um, yeah. But what i what i also heard from what you explained about your journey with uh, feedback pandas actually that you not only uh, created a better solution but you've also been um part of an existing ecosystem actually mm -hmm. within another company kind of um yeah. is that something which uh, helped you there yes it really helped us particularly with one thing like we uh, we could have just built a product that you can log into and then you can have your templates and you can quickly uh, put a student's name in and they would automatically put the name of the student in the template and choose the, the right like gender uh, like pronouns and stuff like because you have male and female students in china there's it's a very a very binary system still <laughs> and that that was um the the tool just generated text that you could just copy and paste and that that was the basic function of the tool and we could have just left it at that but we knew that there was this community of users and we knew that um there's an interesting blog post by ryan kulp about the um, um the what was it the referral systems and the shareability of a business it's an interesting point that he makes in the blog post um he, he says it really depends on the kind of customers that you have how shareable your business is because if you build a tool like feedback panda that is used by a community of teachers where every teacher is trying to teach right that's what they do so they will also teach other teachers how to teach well that's just part of the <laughs> dna of being a teacher so any tool you build to help one teacher they want to want they want other teachers to also use so they, it's innately shareable it's great that makes for an amazing product that is a has a like a referral system built and maybe affiliates and all that kind of stuff but now imagine you build a tool for high frequency traders for people who need the edge in their business now they're not going to tell the other trader that they have a tool that gets them like five milliseconds faster to the trade that's not a shareable business. It is just the same software as a service. They log in, they do some stuff, they click a button and they get a result, right? But the nature of the business is completely different. But we knew that teachers were teachers. Like they were already building systems collaboratively for free for each other. So we understood that any kind of um, 
system that we implemented within our business that allowed them to share stuff would cause them to try not only to share with each other, but to get other people in there as well. Like they understood the, the strength of a network effect already because they already had communities. So when they saw an opportunity to get other teachers into a product so they could share their templates with them, uh, like that, that was our growth vector. Because I, we, we built this, this internal, we called this the Feedback Panda Cloud. Again, not very technical people. So that was a very impressive name, right? Like, oh, the cloud. But they could share their, their feedback templates with each other. And we would rank them by the amount of times they had been imported into somebody else's database. So the, the good, uh, highly imported uh, templates would bubble up to the top. And those teachers would then become kind of famous in their communities for having the highly ranked templates. So we also kind of built some structure, some community structure around it. It was actually quite fun. And I fondly remember the customer service conversations with, with these people. And I don't think like that is something most SaaS founders will say when they talk about <laughs> the customer service conversations, because most of the time you get yelled at because people want something that they can't have, right? But with our teachers, they were actually quite kind. They were very friendly. They were very supportive. Again, teachers, right? They knew how to say something so they could get what they wanted and in a, in a very friendly and empathetic way. So I, I very fondly remember the community that we were in, that we were empowering, helping, and that kind of paid us money to be able to use the product. It was just a, a great initial community. And that's one of the things that we talked about the, the embedded entrepreneurship approach earlier. I, I wrote a book called The Embedded Entrepreneur. And one of the first things that I do in this book is kind of guide readers through this step of figuring out who they want to build a business for, because I think that's one of the most important choices. And that's a choice we made with these teachers. We saw, hey, these are actually cool people. These are people that are, they're not, they're stressed, obviously. They're super underpaid. They're undervalued. You know, teachers, they don't get money wherever you go. They don't really have any good salaries or anything like it. They have to work multiple jobs. It's really sad. But we we wanted to help them because we knew that they put their heart and soul into their teaching, right? It was so obvious that these people love the teaching kids and, and making their lives better. It was so almost heartbreakingly clear that this this group of people wanted to give more than they could ever get in return. And we thought these are the people we want to help. And we we chose that very consciously. We could have helped other people do documentation stuff. We could have extended the product into not just like student feedback, but also medical feedback or feedback on like lawyer interactions or tax advisor interactions or anything like it. But we we chose teachers because they, they needed it the most. And that choice was elemental for all the choices that we made in the product and the business and in communicating the branding, the positioning, all of these things. So that's why I start in the book. I tell people, make a list of all the potential groups of people you could help, you would want to help, right? If you're a software engineer, you probably want to help software engineers or you want to help marketers or uh, founders or writers or whatever you can come up with. And then the first thing you do is you rank them by your, the affinity that you have. Because I did the exercise myself in, in writing the book and I had a list of like 30 or 40 different groups of people. Writers rank pretty high, software engineers rank pretty high because I could relate to that. But I also thought, hmm, maybe I can help lawyers do their thing because I know how to deal with documents or tax advisors because I know how to use APIs and you know shuffle data back and forth. But then I kind of looked into my affinity for lawyers or tax advisors and I thought, huh, it's probably not the kind of crowd that I want to hang out with for the next 10 years and nothing against them, right? They're, they're obviously professionals in their own field, but it's just a mentality of a tax advisor it's not the mentality of a creative writer or somebody who's like trying to build a software product or, or build like an indie hacker, something like this. It's just a different kind of group of people. But I thought, I don't want to work for these people and, and empower them and, and be there for them in customer service conversations for the next decade. I don't want to do that. I can definitely do that with writers or founders. Right? It's kind of what I do now. I just talk to founders all the time and I love it. There's always something that comes out of it that helps both them and myself. So it's kind of selfish, but also attempt an attempt at selflessness. So it, it helped. It's kind of a win-win situation. And if you do that from the beginning, then you don't fall into the trap of just seeing money, right? Oh yeah, I can help tax advisors because they have a lot of money. These people or lawyers, right? They owe the cash. Sure, you can have money, but you're going to hate your job. And if, if you hate your job as an employee, that's all right, right? At least you get paid. But if you hate your job as a founder, then you are the person that needs to make positive change in an industry you hate. It's just, that's the dissonance, right? And it's really hard to maintain. So that's why if you want to build your own business, you have to start with who you are going to help 
And from there, you can find their communities, join their communities, be part of it, understand what their problems are, the stuff that I talked about earlier. But that's the first thing that needs to be done. And that's the first thing that we did for the very first time too. Like for the first time in my life with Feedback Panda, that was the choice that we made intentionally from the start. I'm gonna help these people. So everything followed from that. And again, hindsight, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. You never really know. And we all have confirmation bias. So grain of salt here. But I think that making this intentional choice and aiming every direction at empowering these people for these specific reasons made it easier to find success with the business. Luck was involved. Good timing was involved. The fact that the Chinese companies were growing like crazy. All of this was involved in the success of the business too. But the foundations of it were conscious choices that we made. Yeah, so as as you explain it now, it basically sounds like it was like every day was a happy day. Yeah, <laughs> no no cool. downs or, or, or always only ups. <laughs> uh, yeah, but every every day had um like if you run a business it's always up and down, right? And that's kind of what I love about building in public, something that I try to do and encourage people to do, share the ups, of course, because that's awesome, but also share the downs because that's just realistic. Because if you want to build relationships with people in your field or with other founders around you, only sharing the highlights, people are going to see through that and they see that you, you're kind of selective. But if you share the downs as well, the stuff that doesn't work, they, they relate to you like a human being because we all have downs all the time. Right? It's just normal that things don't work for us. And so that's, let me talk about Feedback Panda and my downs at that time. So the first biggest, biggest problem that I had for the whole time of running the business was that I was the only technical person in the business. That was a down because if something is down, like a server or a part of the infrastructure, I need to do it. And it doesn't matter if that happens at like two in the afternoon when I have time for it or two in the morning when I'm sleeping, right? I needed to set up systems that kind of get me out of sleep if there was any kind of problem. And that happened a couple of times to the point where I was quite, well, I was quite afraid of my phone. In, in, in the way I had like, um, what would I call this like intercom PTSD? Because the intercom sound, the little bubble, the chat bubble in, in the bottom right of most websites that goes up when a customer service conversation starts, that bubble always indicated stress to me because it might be downtime. It might be a problem with the service and now all of our customers can't use it. And at the end, after two years of running the business, we had 5,000 customers concurrently. And we is still just Danielle and me, right? We ran this business as just two people running a highly automated business. So every time this happened was quite stressful. And as the only technical person, there was nobody I could rely on to solve these problems. I needed to solve them myself. And that was always like a baseline anxiety that stuff like this would happen. The other problem, which is more of a, a potential problem, not a real problem, was that we were not just a business partnership, we were also a couple. So my girlfriend and I are running a business. So any kind of stress that the business creates seeps over into your relationship. Fortunately, we'd been together for a couple of years at that point already. So we had established ways to communicate, to be very clear and honest with each other. And as you can tell, we're still together. So that worked. But the the the, the any kind of stress that happened in, in the business, any kind of downtime or customers complaining, that always we, we couldn't just leave it at home because our business was from home, right? We we just we, we ran our business from the the living room we had a little office but you know it's it's one like three room apartment in the middle of berlin it's not much space to escape from so the the anxiety kind of permeated the whole life of both founders which sometimes can cause stress particularly in a world where you're working 24 7 because you have a global business you have customers in the states you have customers all over the world really because i mean they were they were uh, these chinese companies were hiring Americans and Canadians, but they didn't care really about where those people lived. And some of them lived in Australia, some of them lived in Vietnam, some were in like Taiwan and China, like all, all over the world. They, they, these people had problems from time to time and they reached out and we always needed to be there. And it was quite stressful. So one of the biggest uh, takeaways from that for me is that I should have hired way earlier, just somebody to take this to screen all these little things for me for a little bit, either a technical person or a customer service rep, somebody just to say, we're working on it, give us a couple hours so that I could sleep in and then solve the problem. And most of the time it was really just a server reboot or 
uh, publishing a new version of the browser extension because something changed, uh, you know, and you need to kind of update stuff. But yeah, the, the stress levels, they were horrible to the point where I was getting closer and closer to burnout. It's kind of hard to look at in retrospect because at the time when we sold the business, I either was very close to or in the middle of burnout. I'm not really sure. I think I was in it. I just kind of kept even recognizing it, um, just to push that away, right? So when somebody reached out, it was Kevin um, Kevin McArdle from Shortswift Capital, it was a private equity business that had a lot of SaaS businesses that they had already acquired, I think like some 20 some businesses that they had acquired previously to ours. When they reached out, um, I was quite happy about it. I was happy to sell my business because I was just so frustrated. Not that the business wasn't growing. It was. At that point, we made like $55,000 in monthly recurring revenue on a business that had like a 90 some percent profit margin. That was super profitable. Like we were paying ourselves salaries that we couldn't have imagined before. It was wonderful. And there's a lot of value in that. But it was it came with this anxiety. And I don't think anxiety is really worth that much money, going to be honest. So I was glad to sell it. For many reasons, if it, if I had not done this at that point, we had kept running the business, growing it even further. We probably could have sold for even more, even though we sold for life changing amount. I'm not allowed to say, but you know, we we, we essentially now we're retired. Um, we still do stuff because we want to do stuff. Uh, so for for that for that reason, it, it was I felt compelled to sell. And that's not a good place to negotiate from, right? So that's also a down. So I, I, I talk about these things openly because I feel we all have these problems. We rarely get to see into the experience of somebody else. So I try to share as much as I can. Also really the mental health issues because founders, man, we all have these things, right? We have constant imposter syndrome. We always think, oh, we shouldn't be the ones doing this. And oh, the competitors are going to destroy our business. And oh, the customers hate me. And is this feature really a good idea? Like that stuff is in my mind all the time. And I'm already post exit. It's like the most bizarre thing. Like it never leaves you. So maybe that helps. It doesn't leave you, but you just don't have to listen to it. <laughs> it's kind of my, my approach to imposter syndrome at this point. It's just, yeah, yeah, you talk. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. But yeah, I think mental health topics like this are, are super important to, to talk about. So thank you for allowing me to go on this gigantic monologue about my experience with Feedback Panda. But uh, I'm, 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 I'm fortunate to be able to tell this story because we went through it and came out of in, on a po positive note. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot for, for sharing what you learned and uh, for, uh, yeah, hopefully helping many other people that way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the beginning of your monologue, <laughs> you, you talked about uh, building in public and um, yeah, also sharing the downs. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, made the experience that it's not even that easy to share the downs so yeah. you're always uh, looking for opportunities to to share the the wins but yeah. when you're down it's more like well do i really want to share that or yeah. how how do i share that in yeah like a relatable way i i recently um read a tweet i forgot by by whom but they were saying that if you want to share negative things don't share them while they're happening. Mm -hmm. Like that is one of the things about ne negative stuff. Like if you are in the trenches, everything looks scary. And I don't really want to use warm metaphors much, but the idea is that you, you're constantly under stress, you're under duress, like something is happening that you can control. That's why it's negative, right? Like something is happening to you that you don't want. Talking about it at that point, not a good idea. Give it a week and recap after you've solved it or recap after the outcome of it impacted you in some capacity, right? Maybe you're, you had a lot of churn that month, but instead of talking about, oh, my churn this month is super high, give it a month, see if the churn actually like turns around or if that is just the new direction into which your business is going. And now you can strategize because you know, okay, we did it for two months in a row, churn increased a little but now with my trajectory i need to blah, 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 right you have all these things you can do at this point and you can take it as a non-emotional thing instead of being surrounded by the stress and talking about it at the same time with good things you can usually do this at the time when they're happening but if you're an info product creator and you're running a sale and you get a hundred people buying it within an hour you should talk about it right then when it happens because first off it's awesome 
and then it amplifies the potential of even more sales in the future. So good things, talk about them immediately. Bad things, talk about them, but give it some time to reflect on it and, and remove the, the anxiety and all the, the emotional um, upheaval from the information. That's, that's how I do it too. Like when something doesn't work, you know, take a screenshot, put it aside, consider how you can reflectively give and teach through that instead of just uh, you know, looking for comfort or looking for people to, to get, tell you, oh, you can do it. You can you can get that information later as well. You don't need it in that moment. Yeah, great. So um, then, also referring to uh, challenges, I have one question from Twitter. Martin asks uh, about your uh, biggest challenge right now. Hmm. Honestly, um, I just recently started doing interview shows on my podcast because my biggest challenge is loneliness. I feel like living in my little basement has been really nice because, you know, I, I consider myself like a, a basement dwelling nerd back from the day where that was cool, you know, <laughs> where you had your, your little miniature painting station and your magic, the gathering table in the basement, you know, that stuff, that's my life. That's how I like it. But with the pandemic and with Danielle being off on her own, doing her own things, like she's a musician and she, she's, she's doing her thing, which is awesome, but it means that I'm mostly alone. And that increases loneliness, right? Even though I have a puppy that I hang out with and I have you and everybody else I talk to every day on Twitter, it's not the same. It's not the same as having a conversation face to face, which is why I started um, the podcast, the interview shows on the podcast. And that has been, first of an amazing opportunity to learn, but even more an amazing opportunity to connect with people, to have like a, real conversation about things that we both care about and then looking into each other's faces and seeing, okay, there's a person, there's a real person behind this Twitter handle, like a person with feelings and with like their own goals and, and the story somewhere. And I just love that. And that's been the solution to my challenge really, because that is, has been the only challenge. My business has been growing. Like I, I run a newsletter. I have a podcast, both of them are sponsored. And over time sponsors have been, increasing in numbers and then the amount of money that they pay. So that's been going well. I write every week. I still have a lot of things that I want to write about. So that's really not a challenge. And I get a lot of the topics that I want to talk about from my community on Twitter anyway. So social interactions creates the content or the topics of the content that I write about. Not a challenge either, but being alone in my basement, I never thought I would say this. That's not the optimal way of living. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm getting older, right? I'm, I, just, I, mean, I think I'm just understanding a couple things better than when I was younger and I was still following kind of the, the memes of what it meant to be a developer. Like be solipsistic, video games all the time and just uh, be really nerdy. Yeah, but you can also have like social connections with people and actually talk about th things that you care about. That is not just tech, but also like, you know, life things or mental health, uh, topics like this. So that's that's been the challenge that I'm working on, like connecting more with people, building strong relationships and is is there any way uh, people can support you oh man support me that's uh, honest follow me on twitter and uh, talk to me on twitter don't, don't even follow me on twitter just reach out to me on twitter i, I don't i'm not looking for for numbers even though the numbers that i have are mind-blowingly huge never expected to to ever have followers beyond uh yeah the numbers i have just incomprehensible but if if you want to talk to me twitter is a great place because that's where i hang out most of the time and even though everybody thinks that twitter is going to implode in a couple of weeks or months or whatever i believe it'll be around or in some capacity the community that is currently on twitter will be somewhere so just follow the traces but yeah i'm, I'm avid kyle at twitter a-r-v-a-d-e-k-a-h-l and um from there you can find everything i do cool then thanks a lot for taking the time Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for taking part in this Never Employed Chat. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interviews with business owners and investors. Or simply listen to the audio version in your favorite podcast directory. Make sure to follow me on all your preferred social media platforms, so that you never miss life-changing business tips. You find me on every platform with the account name samhartman.com. Start a business, become successful, and tell me about it. See you next time.